questions. Our, uh, our next panel is, uh, is going to, uh, Rock in the last panel made references to, uh, to Denver and Colorado several times. And we're going to, to uh, kind of stay in an associated uh, subject matter with uh, Colorado. Our next panel is on legalized marijuana and uh, some of the, the research and work that's been done in that, uh, in that field. And our moderator for that panel is Pauline Weaver. Pauline is a criminal defense attorney in Fremont, California. Please welcome the panel and Pauline. Thanks, Matt, very much. Well, welcome to Dazed and Confused, and um, we're hoping that by the time this panel's over with, you'll be less dazed and confused. Um, currently, there are 29 states that have medical marijuana laws and eight states that allow for recreational use of marijuana, despite the fact that there's no real easy way for law enforcement to test for someone behind the wheel uh, who may have marijuana-induced impairment. A field sobriety test, as you know, is used when a motorist is suspected of reckless driving and a breathalyzer is used to gauge the level of alcohol in a driver's bloodstream. But there's nothing similar to a breathalyzer for testing whether someone is driving under the influence of marijuana. A study by the AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety has found that Washington State um, the proportion of drivers in accidents who tested positive for THC, the component that gives cannabis its psychological effects, rose from 20 to 30 percent between 2005 and 2014. Washington legalized medical marijuana in 1999 and its recreational use in 2012. But another study by the foundation found that a quantitative threshold cannot be scientifically supported since people process THC differently. Saliva swab tests cost around $25 and check the mouth for marijuana and other common drug use in the past 24 to 36 hours. But even these tests can be unreliable because they detect marijuana use in the past eight days in some cases. Today we're going to discuss these and other issues with our two experts, and I'm sure you're going to find them really entertaining. First, Tom Kimball. Tom is director of the National Traffic Safety Law Center and is a 1982 graduate of the University of Tennessee School of Law, and I promised him I wouldn't hold it against him, even though I graduated from the University of Memphis. As director of NTLC, he is a frequent speaker at conferences concerning impaired driving and other traffic safety topics. Tom served as traffic safety resource prosecutor for the state of Tennessee for 15 years after spending 20 years as an assistant district attorney, assistant public defender, private practitioner, and city judge. Tom was honored to receive the Kevin A. Quinlan Award from the Foundation for Advancing Alcohol Responsibility on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. in 2014 and the Tennessee Mad Excellence Award in 2015. Please welcome Tom Kimball. I have to get over my, uh, my heebie-jeebies before I talk to you because I was <laughs> listening to the last panel and when I heard the word source code, I started to have nightmare reactions because we went through source code issues and battles in breath testing for so many years around the country and those have pretty much settled down now, but. Um, it, it drove everybody a little bit insane. So when I, when I heard the word source code in the last panel, I, I, you know, you saw me shaking in the back row, that would be fine. Okay, so Pauline told us that there's 29 states that now have medical marijuana, um, plus DC, so we wanna keep the district involved because uh, you know I'm there now, and eight that have uh, recreational marijuana, plus DC, um, again, for the same reason. So. Because of that, the National District Attorneys Association started looking at what should our position be, where are we on this thing, and NDAA put together a panel and they uh, issued a white paper on April the 24th of this year, just a little more than a month ago. And NDAA on the white paper basically came out and said that um, NDAA is, continue, is, is encouraging further research but they would like the research to be consistent with the methodology used by the FDA. 
as opposed to, you know, we have some research studies, mostly industry related, that say marijuana is the best thing since sliced bread, it'll cure everything. And then we have other research studies over here that say marijuana, not so good, it's going to shrivel your brain down to a reason and you're going to implode. So it would be nice to see some really well-conducted scientific research from independent sources as opposed to the way we got here. And the way we got here with, medical, with uh, marijuana was basically states, most of them, you know, it started out west, where uh, referendums, um, voters decided, oh, we're going to legalize this stuff. And of course, much of that was done after massive amounts of money were poured into legalization campaigns by people who knew that you know, once it passed, they were going to become multimillionaires. And uh, that has come true. So that's not really what you would call a standard research approach that really looks at both sides and examines and evaluates what's this, um, what's this going to do to people. Um, now getting away from NDAA and just talking about NTLC, in the driving world, um, you know, I, I've been in the traffic law field for the last 18 years exclusively. All I've been doing is traffic related stuff. You know, and, and, and I'm really honored to be in this room full of very smart people. Uh, you know, my dad and mom in Tennessee would be just shocked that I would be speaking to uh, lawyers in New York City about anything. Um, they'd be shocked that I even made it to New York City in my lifetime. Um, we're all really smart people in here. You're all very smart people. You all went through law school because none of us were smart enough to figure out that we could have gone into some other professions. But yeah, never mind about that. Um, so. When it comes to marijuana, the challenges that we're facing are pretty massive. It's much different to try to tell if a driver who has smoked some marijuana is impaired than it, to tell if a person who's consumed alcohol is impaired. We know alcohol, we've known alcohol for you know, a very long time. Um, we see the signs. You go to a party, you know who's had too much, to, you know, almost immediately when you walk in the door and said, uh oh, that guy's gonna be trouble. So we know the fallen down drunk type of mentality. And we know people that are uh, really, really out of it from drugs when we see them, um, heroin users, for instance. But marijuana is a little different because as Pauline said, it stays in this system for a longer period of time, it's harder to detect. So it's harder for the cops, it's harder for the prosecutors, it's harder for defense attorneys to know whether they have a legitimate defense in the case or if the guy was really impaired. It's harder for every, because of presumption from our friend who was on the panel before, is everybody's not guilty, I think was the word, but you know, their position is going to be not guilty. But across the board, we want to convict guilty people and not people who are not guilty. We have more than enough work to do to convict the guilty. We, we don't need to be filling jails or convicting people or giving people the ramifications if they're not. So the question becomes, how do we distinguish if a person is guilty of this crime if all they have consumed is uh, some marijuana at some point in time? Now, the time of use is very important to us. Um, you know, if, if, if the guy rolls down the window and a cloud comes out, well, we pretty sure that the time of use was pretty close to the time that the window was rolled down. Um, if, if the detection tells us, um, you know, we see metabolites, but we don't see THC, then we're looking at, well, what does that really mean? How do we tell when that was consumed? Was that impairing? Now, for us in the traffic safety world, it's a little easier than it is in the drug world. Um, because all we have to do is show that the person was impaired. As a prosecutor, I don't really care if it's marijuana, a synthetic cannabinoid, if it's some other drug, if it's oxycodone, if it's whatever it is, I don't have to prove that it was that particular item that caused the impairment. I gotta show the person was too impaired to be safely driving a car um, on our highways. So most states have, not all, but most states have gone with a proposition, their law says, if a person's impaired by drugs, by alcohol, 
or by any other chemical substance that causes impairment, then we can prove that that person's guilty of a DUI. So, you know, I want to see impairment. So what, what we've been trying to emphasize to our folks is quite simply this. Whatever the lab gives us is gravy. Whatever the lab gives us is corroboration of the impairment that's on the video or the impairment that the officer saw. Quite frankly, the labs can be very disappointing to us. They have some pretty high cutoff levels. Um, they have some many labs that cannot test for the things that are causing the impairment. Um, sometimes we have to, we, in Tennessee, we would have to send stuff up to um, the lab in Pennsylvania, NMS, to find out if there was active THC or not. Then, of course, we could never get the witnesses to come back to Tennessee without charging us uh, an arm and a leg. So, you know, pretty much we would get the information and we would try to bluff our, our fellow lawyers into a, a plea because um, that's the only way, if it was a misdemeanor case, that's the only way we could use that information. Um, if it's a homicide, we, we'd bring the people from Pennsylvania, even though it cost us ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. But if it was a standard misdemeanor DUI, there's no way they would give us that money to pay to have the experts come and testify. Just not a possibility. So all of that is a challenge for us, but we've tried very hard to, to, to make sure that the focus is on is the person impaired at the scene or is the person not impaired at the scene with the recognition that the labs are only going to be able to help us uh, corroborate. They're not proof of impairment when it comes to uh, a particular nanogram level per millimeter. Um, we, we don't know what that, the nanogram per millimeter isn't going to do a whole lot for us. Now, some states have passed a five nanogram um, uh, per se limit for DUI, that, uh, for marijuana DUI, that's been a policy decision. It's not been a scientific decision. Quite frankly, the, you know, you have legislators who say, well, we need a number. Here we go. <laughs> that's a good one, five. Let's go with it. But I think when, a doc, when a Professor Hustis gets up here, she'll talk to you about um, its limitations. So there's a few things that have been very helpful for us. One, we have drug recognition experts who are just trained out of the kazee to find out if a person's impaired or not. These people, I've gone through the training. Um, you know, I went to law school because I wanted to avoid math and science, and now here I am in uh, <laughs> studying biology, chemistry, physics. That's what I do for a living. But these guys go through extensive training. They're very good, but they are not the average officer. They are a specialist but they are very few in number compared to the number of officers there are in the country. And so we have a great program, it's just not a very big program. Um, now we have oral fluid testing coming along, and uh, I'm gonna defer to uh, Professor Hustis to tell more about that, but there are about four reasons that prosecutors really love the idea of oral fluid testing. The first is that the testing is close to the time of driving. So we don't have that long period of delay when the bloodstream is pumping and things are happening and you end up with all the THC gone by the time the test is conducted two hours after driving. The second is that testing is way less invasive, invasive than a blood test. You know, who wants to get stuck with a needle? They don't have to. And the it, it, the, the, the benefit to that, I, I've seen this done. Um, I was able to go to Los Angeles where they were having a, a sobriety checkpoint in Los Angeles. That's a whole other story, how they managed to do that with all the traffic and the crazy drivers out there. But they were doing this and they had the oral fluid sample. They also had the breath testing sample. They had a nurse to draw blood. They had everybody there um, at this particular um, sobriety checkpoint. They even had the jail there, they had the bailiff there, um, they had a magistrate there to sign search warrants. It was it's quite a production. They just sort of moved the whole thing to the side of the road and everybody was there. Um, but one guy did an oral fluid test during one of the, uh, one of the many states that are uh, uh, trying it out. And uh, this guy was a, uh, he, he had been smoking some, some, some weed. You know, he told the police that, uh, you know, he had that look about him. And uh, he had the little swab that you put in your mouth. 
and he rubbed it around in his mouth, and you could tell he was really having sort of a good time with it, and he was just <laughs> rubbing and rubbing. And about five minutes later, you know, it's supposed to, like, give you a sign that it's done. It still had it. He hadn't picked up enough fluid. But eventually they stopped it and they put it in the little mechanism. And 15 minutes later, here's the test result coming out. It showed marijuana. And then they said, hey, man, it shows marijuana. He says, well, of course it showed marijuana. I've been smoking, you know. So <laughs> it's one of those deals because they had Mirandized him. So, but, um, so, so that is much less invasive than a blood draw. I don't think he would have enjoyed the blood draw nearly as much. Um, the, uh, the testing uh, of oral fluid collection probably is not going to require a search warrant in the same way that a blood test will um, because it is less invasive and you know we would argue at least that it's a way less invasive than a blood test so that and that also means that the search warrant delay which is commonly a couple of hours is going to be gone um, it can be activated and you can get your officers back on the road more quickly and that's going to be beneficial. And then the fourth thing is the testing is going to separate out uh, people with medical conditions as opposed to people who are under certain drug categories um, more quickly. Um, you know, it's, it's the argument we've always made on breath testing. Look, if you, if you haven't been drinking, you take the breath test and it shows you haven't been drinking and there aren't any drugs involved, you're going home. Whereas if you have a little odor of an alcoholic beverage about you because you had a sip of beer and then you uh, refuse a test, you're probably going to go to jail because you refused. And then we're going to argue that the reason you refused is because you were drunk and you were drunk because. And so, you know, this this is one of those things that the ultimate in innocence projects is to be able to prove right there at the scene. This guy's not uh, a customer. This isn't somebody who needs to go get booked and taken to the jail. So those are the reasons prosecutors are excited about it. It's also about five reasons, I'm going to go very quickly here, that prosecutors are cautious and nervous about it. The first point is, will the labs cooperate? Will they evolve to handle more oral fluid testing than they're doing right now? Most labs are doing blood testing, uh, some doing urine testing, some doing... Uh, combination, but most labs aren't doing a lot of oral fluid testing. So will the labs, will state labs, or your general labs evolve? Um, is the panel of drugs for oral fluid testing just too small? Right now it's basically looking for five categories of drugs, which I'll leave to Professor Hustis. Um, the training time, the time frame for training law enforcement officers, the, the DREs out in Los Angeles really didn't like doing this. They did it because they were asked to do it. They were being paid to do it, but they really didn't like doing it. They didn't feel like that was part of their job. It, they sit there while the guy does 15 minutes of, or five minutes of swabbing it in his mouth and putting it in the kit and all that. The next is, uh, will there be enough trained, qualified officers in this area in order to be doing it? One of the problems we have right now is nobody wants to sign up to be a cop anymore. Too many of them have been killed the last few years, and almost every agency is suffering from a lack of people applying to join the agency. So where are we going to get the people to do this, and, and will that work? And the last one is we know that whenever we try, whenever anything new comes into the system, we will be buried in Daubert and Fry hearings, um, thanks to our friends in the defense bar. And, you know, we'll tolerate those and we'll get through those. And, and um, I don't think there's anything too terribly new or novel about any of this. It, it's going to really waylay anything. But it takes years to get through that process to that conclusion in our court system. So that's kind of where prosecutors are coming from on oral fluid. Um, we're hopeful, but we're cautious. Um, we need to do, we obviously need some answers because uh, there's a lot more people driving now marijuana in their system than ever before, uh, which is no reason for anyone to celebrate in, in, uh, in our country. Thank you.
Thanks, Tom, very much. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Marilyn Hustis, who recently retired as a tenured senior investigator and chief chemistry and drug metabolism section, IRP, National Institute on Drug Abuse, National Institutes of Health, after 23 years of conducting controlled drug administration studies. She's an adjunct professor at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, Baltimore, and she's overseen the research of over 20 distinguished new toxicologists and international scientists from more than 20 countries training within and outside her laboratory. She's published an astounding 447 peer-reviewed manuscripts and book chapters, and more than 500 abstracts were presented at national and international meetings. Professor, Professor Hustis received her bachelor's degree in biochemistry from Mount Holyoke College, a master's degree in cl clinical chemistry from the University of New Mexico with honors, and a doctoral degree in toxicology from the University of Maryland with honors. She also received a, doctor, a doctorate honor, honoris causa from the, universe, from the Faculty of Medicine, University of Helsinki in Finland in 2010. Welcome. <laughs> okay, so while we start on that, dazed and confused, um, I hope you won't be dazed and confused when I'm through uh, talking. We Normally, I'd like to give a whole lot more context, but we have a lot of different topics to cover, and what we're hoping to do is stimulate some um, uh, good question and answers later on. So the topic, I've been doing uh, cannabis research since... Uh, I guess about 28 years, and oops, you've got the wrong one, sir. <laughs> this isn't mine. Okay. All right. Anyhow, so I'm going to talk about um, cannabis in driving. I'm going to talk about blood concentrations uh, and what happens with them. I'm going to talk about why it's there. It's impossible to come up with the perfect number. You know, Canada is making cannabis legal. Uh, throughout their country very shortly, and they had me come up to Canada and talk with their legislators and policy uh, makers, and they said, just give us the number, just give us the number, everything will be fine, we'll make a per se level. And then I'm going to talk about oral fluid testing and why it represents such a good um, possibility for, uh, for using, looking at uh, cannabis-impaired driving. Okay, so there are some very strong short-term consequences of this new, uh, what I call the great U.S. experiment uh, on medical and legal cannabis. And one is we absolutely know that there's been increased driving, uh, driving under the influence of cannabis, and Pauline gave the data from the state of Washington. Uh, actually, not only now is it at 30%, but the increase was 25% increase in uh, drug-impaired driving cases related to cannabis in the first six weeks after cannabis uh, uh, legal, was legalized. Um, so certainly we know mor morbidity and mortality is going up. A huge issue is decreased uh, perception of risk of young people. And not only young people, because if you tell me something is legal and it's actually medicine now, how could it hurt me? Who in the world would pass laws that would make this uh, possible if it could hurt me? And we know that's not true. I actually have parents calling me saying, I'm so proud my child is not drinking and driving. They're only smoking cannabis and driving. <laughs> you know, that's, a, that's really a problem. Uh, we know that there's been a big increase in emergency department visits by uh, children who are exposed now uh, to the cannabis, especially edibles. You know that in many states they were, and certainly in Colorado, they're in the shape of gummy bears and wiggle worms and lollipops and brownies, things that are very attractive uh, to children. Um, a good uh, outcome of this, and I am for uh, therapeutic use of cannabinoids. Um, it was brought up that we need the research to prove that it's efficacious. And until just a couple of months ago, there were no studies, zero studies, that were well designed and uh, blinded and appropriate to show the effectiveness 
of cannabis on any indication. I'm really happy to say now there are now two studies and others that are completing shortly, two studies that have shown that cannabidiol, which is a non-psychoactive cannabis uh, a material in cannabis plant, that cannabidiol has been shown to be efficacious for reducing the seizures that you've seen on uh, Sanjay Gupta and others about um, refractive seizures in children, Dravet syndrome and uh, Lennox Gastaut. So we have the first studies now coming out showing that at least some components of the of the cannabis plant uh, are both safe and efficacious. Okay, there's also long-term consequences that I'm not gonna be talking about. We have done another area of research for me is in utero drug exposure, and we have all the data we need to say that um, smoking cannabis when you're pregnant uh, will definitely result in a heavy use of cannabis when you're pregnant will result in poor child developmental outcomes. We, we have that data. And yet, do you know there are obstetricians in Colorado who are prescribing cannabis for pregnant patients for nausea and vomiting. So we have to educate um, the public um, much more. We have great data showing that if there's heavy use of cannabinoids at during the time that the brain is still developing, which we used to thought, think was maybe 18 or 20, we now know the brain is still developing to the late 20s, 28, 29, some period of time like that. And we know that if the just at the time when young people are using cannabinoids, when they're supposed to be getting their education, their brain is forming and the connections, the actual way the nerves connect to each other um, is affected by uh, chronic frequent cannabis use. That's something that does not change if they decide not to be smoking cannabis later on. We know already we have increased admissions for cannabis treatment uh, for dependents, and we don't know, and I don't have time, I'd love to talk to you about all the functions of the endogenous cannabinoid system in our brains, uh, but we know that that's an extremely important system in our brain, and basically involved in many survival functions like hunger, uh, like emotion, like memory, uh, and other areas. So we don't know what, how that is going to be affected by chronic frequent cannabis use. So let's talk about one of the short-term consequences, and this is um, the effect on cannabis and driving. If you need a primer, this paper is now a couple years old, but we review all the past literature on uh, cannabis and driving, and that might be helpful to you sometimes. In the US, we are way behind Europe and Australia and other areas on the issue of cannabis and driving. And our big wake up call came in 2007 when the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration did their sort of every 10 years, they do a survey. It had always been focused only on alcohol, based on breathalyzers. And for the first time, we've been screaming as toxicologists, you know, the fact that uh, we don't have a good measure of how much drugs are affecting driving. We don't have the epidemiological data that would help us do that. So they decided for the first time to take blood and saliva or oral fluid and to look for drugs of, as well as for alcohol. And it was a shock. 8.6% of weekend nighttime drivers were positive in either blood or oral fluid for cannabinoids. It does not say that they're impaired. It just says that they had the drugs in their system at the time. Well, the Office of National Drug Control Policy, ONDCP, said, wow, we don't want to uh, wait another 10 years to look at this problem. But we've known for a long time with the small amount of data that we've had that as alcohol impaired driving has decreased since the 1970s, that drug impaired driving has been increasing very steeply. And one thing, Tom, that you brought up about many states have a law that says alcohol or drugs, we don't care 
which it is, that's really a problem because it's much cheaper and easy to do the alcohol. And so if the alcohol is above a certain level, they don't even test the blood for drugs. And so we've had a tremendous lack of information about what the drug impaired driving has been. They redid this in 2013, 14, uh, based on ONDCP's urgency. Uh, ONDCP made uh, impaired driving, one of the top three initiatives or strategi strategies uh, at the time to reduce it. And what did they find? Now 12.6% of weekend nighttime drivers were cannabinoid positive. That represented a 48% increase in only five years. And we know from fatalities that cannabis is the primary, and I'm sorry I'm missing a word there, primary illicit drug. There's still more alcohol than there is cannabis, but it is the number one uh, drug in uh, both fatal crashes and um, injuries. Okay, so I had complained to ONDCP and NHTSA and everybody for more than 10 years. This is the world's most advanced driving simulator. It's called the NADS. It's located in, uh, at Iowa, University of Iowa. It was built by NHTSA for the government and primarily it's used by pharmaceutical companies. Um, it is has been used by NHTSA for very important studies like uh, texting. Um, and what you see here is uh, a full, this is an orb, this is, I hope I don't mess this up here. Okay, great. So this is the size of an aircraft carrier, ca uh, hangar, it's very large. This orb contains a full car and 360 degree uh, visuals, uh, so you can make it very realistic. And if you look at all of these, actuators here. It's amazing. When you accelerate, you feel that. We have portions where the person is driving over gravel in a rural setting. Not only do you feel the bumps like you're driving on gravel, you hear crunch, crunch, crunch. It's a very realistic uh, facility. I think it's a tremendous resource and until th three or four years ago, it had never even tested for alcohol and never had tested for an illicit drug. So I complained so much after 10 years, they said, shut up, here's the money, go do the study. <laughs> so we got to do it. Um, so what you will see here is you can look at many, many variables, including, for instance, here, uh, you can see we actually have cameras that are focused on the eyes. So we can look at things like how often the person is searching the periphery uh, to look for danger. We can build in um, a, 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 a drive that was focused on the things we know cannabis affects. Uh, that was very important. It cost a lot of money. This study was close to $2 million to run, so you understand why it's not done all the time. But we've learned a lot from it. We had three different portions. We had an urban segment, that's the yellow one, where there's lights and there's people coming out on uh, walking pedestrians, where we had lights changing. And it's quite interesting because to build this drive was um, uh, took a lot of money to do it. And the first thing we did is we said, go down, drive down the street. When you see this Shell station, turn left. And everybody who was high drove right by the Shell station. So we had to redo <laughs> the drive because that one of the issues about cannabis is short-term memory and the ability to follow instructions. <laughs> so we also had an interstate portion where uh, you had to make decisions about passing people, uh, trucks that were coming on slowly, that kind of thing. And then we had a very long segment, which is this uh, drive in the rural area, because one of the things we know cannabis does, it affects that autonomic driving that we all do. When we're going home, we know the route, we're thinking about other things. That's where cannabis also can affect that ability to be paying attention and produce weaving uh, within the lane as well. Each drive was 45 minutes. It took uh, six drives to do all the different conditions because we tested low-dose alcohol 
alone, as well as uh, two different doses of cannabis with and without combinations with low-dose alcohol. And it costs $1,500 a half hour to run the simulator, so expensive to do. All right, so the study starts out, they have 10 minutes to drink either an active alcohol uh, or placebo, um, and again, to produce a, during the drive a 0.05%. Then they had 10 minutes to uh, smoke uh, the cannabis or placebo cannabis. Uh, they went into the orb. Uh, they didn't know it was up in the air. It was all, they walked down a uh, completely closed um, area, so they went into the simulator, so they didn't realize that they were up in the air and moving around. They drove for 45 minutes. And then with the, one of the smartest things we did is we continued to take both blood THC concentrations and alcohol breathalyzers um, after the drive for a long period of time. And you'll see why that's important later. So I'm just going to give you the highlights. So the first thing that we found that was really interesting was that the breath alcohol peak was significantly delayed when cannabis was on board also. And that's really interesting. Our uh, suggestion for that is we know that cannabis delays gastric emptying. So the stomach going into the intestines is actually, I'm sorry, I said this backwards, the breath alcohol concentration was significantly delayed when cannabis was on board. So the cannabis delays the emptying from the stomach into the intestine. We know most of the alcohol is absorbed into the intestine, so that is probably why that occurred. We also showed that when alcohol was present, we had a significantly higher peak THC concentration. Um, that is very important. Obviously, we know there's an interaction between alcohol and uh, cannabis. So if you have alcohol on board, not only do you have a combination of the impairing effects, but you can get a higher blood THC concentration. Okay, so let's look at the effects on lateral control. So lateral control is that weaving within the lane um, and how severe that is. We know alcohol affects lateral control as well. And so when we uh, showed that there were significant effects, what was so important about this study is that we had within each individual, we had recorded what the effects were on alcohol, what the effects were with placebo, and what the effects were with cannabis. And so we were able to say, what is the THC concentration that produces the same impairment as both a 0.05 alcohol uh, or a 0.08 alcohol. Why am I looking at 0.05? Because most of the world uses 0.05. We're the outlier with a few England and a few other places at 0.08. And if you're in the Scandinavian countries, they use a 0.02. So no matter how many times I said it, and I did a lot of press and radio interviews, um, no matter how many times I said it, this is at the time of driving, okay? So an 8.2 nanogram per mil THC in the blood produce equivalent impairment to an 05 and a 13.1 nanogram per mil uh, equivalent impairment to a 0.08. Now, can't you see what happened? All of the marijuana legalization and normal and everybody said, oh my gosh, we've got too low a concentration of THC in blood in Washington state at a five nanograms per mil. It ought to be 10 or 15. No, it's at the time of driving. In the US, the average time to get a blood sample and now uh, it was brought up about the need for warrants. That's getting more and more and more states are requiring warrants. The average time is between 1.4 and 4 hours 
after the event or the stop before you get the blood sample. They have to get approval to take it. They've got to go to a location where they can uh, get the blood drawn. And of course, number one is taking care of the person. So if it's a, a uh, injury related crash, of course, getting the blood sample is not the most important uh, thing to do. Now in um, Germany, they run, they have police surgeons who are circulating in cars all the time and they'll get called to the point of um, an accident or a crash and they will uh, draw the sample. That's never gonna happen in the US that we're gonna have physicians available to do that. Okay, so very important point. Now, thank goodness we took all the samples afterwards. Um, I've had studies as long as 90 days in my career uh, where the individual is on a closed research unit so we can study them for 90 days. Way too prohibitively expensive to do. Um, but we actually take samples that long a period. We had samples, and what we were able to show is something that we all knew as scientists, that the THC concentration in blood drops very rapidly, but we really didn't have a lot of good data to support it. So now we were able to show that within the first 30 minutes after the stop or the crash, that the THC concentration in blood has decreased about 74%. And after 1.4 hours, which is what I told you is the, the start of the period in the US when you get blood samples, the THC concentration had reduced by 90%. So you can see the problem is that the THC concentrations dropping like a rock and easily that delay can take the THC concentration below uh, whatever per se limit might be, um, might be performed. And I'm always against uh, back extrapolation of uh, cannabis. You can't do it. It doesn't have a linear decrease in concentration. So you can't take the number and try to work backwards to what it was at the time. Okay, how about longitudinal control? So longitudinal control has to do with your speed change and variability, how fast you're going, and how much distance you keep from the car in front of you. And so we looked at that, and we also gave them a, a really good guide to help them. This is right in front of them while they're driving and we tell them to keep the car, uh, the distance between them and the car in front of them within the green area. So they do have a lot of guidance in doing this. And so what we found, as has been shown before, is that THC tends to decrease your speed and that decrease the percent of time you're below the speed limit and increase your following distance. If that's completely opposite to what we have with alcohol, which tends to increase your speed and the time you're above the speed limit, and also the variability in your speed limit. But what was also really interesting is we showed a significant interaction between the THC and the breath alcohol. So here you can see that um, when the THC concentration in the blood increases, you get an increase in the reduction in their speed. And also you get an increase in the mean following distance. If you look at alcohol, as the alcohol concentration increases, you get an increase in the speed. When you look at the two of them together, what you find is here is the increasing THC, and remember we had the alcohol at about 0.05, as the THC concentration increases, then you finally will get to a point where the speed may be reduced. But the concentrations are high immediately right after smoking. In fact, we've proven that the peak concentration of THC in the blood occurs while they're smoking. And we've proven this over and over and people still don't seem to understand that. Smoking, people like to smoke because they can titrate their dose. So if you do an IV of an opioid, for instance, 
the entire amount goes in at once and you can't control it. If you take a pill and swallow it, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. You don't control it. But that's why smoke drugs, whether it's heroin, methamphetamine, all these different drugs that can be smoked now, um, when they're smoking it, they start to feel the effects immediately after the very first puff. And what's the first thing they actually feel is their heart rate starting to increase uh, dramatically after cannabis, as well as the, the psychological response. So they change the way they're smoking while they're smoking to get to a level of high that they're comfortable with and that they feel okay with. And I'd be happy to answer questions about that later. So what happens is the THC concentration really at the peak and when they're still smoking, and as I showed you, it drops like a rock. So most of the time, the alcohol is the primary um, drug that's affecting the speed because the THC is dropping very, very quickly. Okay, so now we're going to get into some pharmacokinetics, and I'm going to talk about acute, occasional cannabis exposure. Um, and I like to think that I studied for half my career the acute, occasional use uh, because I couldn't figure out how in the world we were going to study chronic, frequent cannabis use because in no way from medically or ethically and frankly financially are we ever going to give people as much drug as they give themselves. So this is the, <laughs> which is true. And so how do you study it? That's our real problematic area, but how do we study it? So this, these are the data that I actually did for my doctoral work. Um, before this, we only knew what happened after people finished smoking. Nobody had studied what happens during smoking. Each one of these arrows is a single puff on a cannabis cigarette, and this is the THC concentration here, and you can see how rapidly it increases, and then when they're getting to the point where they start to feel comfortable, uh, with their high, how they change it, and the peak in every person occurs prior to the last puff on the cannabis cigarette, and then you see how rapidly the THC decreases. This is 11-hydroxy THC, which is equipotent, has the same effect as THC. I'll get into some of that later. And here's the carboxy THC that is non-psychoactive. Uh, I think I've talked to you about um, the, the smoking and why people do it. It is a very efficient way to get drug to the brain. Goes right into your lungs, right to the left side of your heart, gets pumped up first to the brain. So the more rapidly you deliver a drug to the brain, the higher the abuse liability of the drug.